And now if you would turn over to Luke 21. Luke 21, our passage today is going to be verses 29 through 36 as we close out this chapter and again this mini-series on end times, the Olivet Discourse. Once you have your Bibles in place, if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word and for prayer. Luke 21, beginning in verse 29. And then he, that being Jesus, spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that the day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. I'd like to ask Tal Moss if you would pray at this time, please. Dear God, we thank you and praise you for your sovereignty and your faithfulness. We thank you for bringing us all here today to praise you, learn about you, and to fellowship with one another. We pray that you will be with Pastor Steve as he concludes this um, challenging mini-series on end times. We pray that you will help him to communicate your message to us and protect him from the attacks of the evil one. Mm. And I'll pray that you will be with us and help us to hear what he has to say and what you have to say and apply it to our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. you. may be seated. I think most of you would give a hearty amen to this as Christians, and I would say as Christians, as we get older, the longer we walk with the Lord, we, we long more and more for His return. Can I get an amen on that? Um, to just be with Him. To be, to be with Him in glory. And to no longer sin. Isn't that going to be great? <laughs> to be done with sin, and to only honor Him in everything that we do. The Bible tells us that no man knows the hour of His return, but we are closer this week than we were last week. We're closer now than when we first started this Olivet Discourse study, and we are closer now than when we first trusted in Christ as Savior. As the day approaches, we've been told several things to do. Last week, Jesus says, as you see the signs, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws near. I think that's kind of interesting that he would say that. Because I think oftentimes as things take place, that especially the signs of the times, we're discouraged and we're down. But he said we should lift up our heads. Our countenance should be up, for the Son of Man is to return. In the passage that we're going to look at today, Jesus said that when you see the signs of the time, two things. Number one, know that the kingdom of God is near. And number two, be watchful. So let's start with that first idea, namely that the kingdom of God is near. There's a parable in this passage, verses 29 through 33. The parable might just simply be an illustration. When you see a fig tree beginning to bud, then you know that the summer is near. That's just the logical, natural outcome. And so as you see the signs of the time, know that the hour is soon approaching for the Lord to return. Now with that being said, for those of you who want to think maybe a little bit differently or sideways or deeper perhaps, Keep in mind in the Old Testament that Israel as a nation is oftentimes referred to as a fig tree. Uh, in one particular case, it's said to be as figs on a tree. And in Jeremiah, it says that it is a fig tree that does not bear fruit. So it is possible that Jesus might have been suggesting that as you see the redemption of Israel beginning, this great redemption of Israel, then know that the signs, this is the signs of the time, the end is near. Now, if you see that in the passage, you'll also have to notice, though, in verses 29 and 30, it says not only the fig tree, but also all trees. So if you're thinking in that thought, then it's not just Israel, the redemption of Israel, but all the nations being saved. So there'd be the sense of a great revival, and hence the re His return is near. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. What I do know is verse 31 is certain. And in verse 20, he says, there, there, So you also... When you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. We have touched on the kingdom of God many times in Luke so far, and we're going to touch on it when we get to the book of Acts. Over 50 times the kingdom of God is mentioned. And I thought it might be good today, in light of that, Jesus says, know that the kingdom of God is near, for us just to touch on a little bit 
about the kingdom of God. If you ever want to do a really deep study that will take you a long time, study the kingdom of God. The elders have been working on it for some time, and it's going to take us some time to complete it. And I think it's a worthy study. Let me just mention the realm, the king, the subjects, the future, and the message. First of all, there is a sense that the kingdom of God includes all things. For God reigns over all. God is the one who created everything, everything except for himself. And over all, he reigns from all eternity to all eternity. By the way, that should give us great comfort. God is on the throne. He rules over everything. We can also say that where the king is, the kingdom is present. So where Jesus is, the kingdom of God is. He is the Son of God, who is also stated to be the Son of David, the King who will reign forever on the throne of David. And by the way, I want us to see this in Scripture. Go back to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I know it's been some time ago that we started our study of Luke, but it would be good for us to remind us, see this in Scripture. In Luke chapter 1, it's the angel Gabriel who's appearing to Mary and telling her about the son that she is going to give birth to. This is Luke chapter 1. I actually want us to notice verse 31. Luke 1, 31 and following. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the highest, Elion. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, you might recall in our study of Luke, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the Jews thought this is it. Clearly, he's demonstrated this power. He must be the Messiah. So he is here to set up his earthly kingdom. The thought would be is he would defeat Rome and therefore reestablish the nation of Israel throughout the land. Those who were present must have thought it was strange and indeed sad that Jesus would say on that occasion, my kingdom is not of this world. That's in John chapter 18. That being said, as Christians, as children of God, we are part of the kingdom of God in a very special way, in a very particular way, in a very blessed way. But do keep in mind, even though right now we are members, we are subjects of the kingdom of God in particular, it is a reality not fully realized. This is not it yet. There is still more to come. We have not yet beheld the fullness of His glory, like on the Mount of Transfiguration. We have not entered yet into eternity in His presence. There is a fuller experience still to come. And so in the meantime, we long for it. As a matter of fact, we pray for it. Remember how we're taught to pray, the model prayer that the Lord gave us? Our Father who art in heaven, what do we say then? Hallowed be thy name. And then what's next? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We long for the kingdom of God to have a greater manifestation. We long for the will of God to be done, not just in heaven, but also here on the earth. And Jesus said, therefore, set your ambitions, your desires upon the kingdom of God. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, which, by the way, ultimately means that we seek first the king of the kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. And then Jesus also said in that passage in Luke, he said that it's the Father's good pleasure to give to you the kingdom. There is still more to come. And the reason we know that this is secure is because our surety is Christ himself. We have confidence in Christ alone because He is with us. He said that if He goes away, He will send another, a helper, a comforter, the Holy Spirit to be within us. And so we have this abiding hope and trust because the kingdom of God, in a sense, is not only among us, but it's within us. I'd like for you to see that as well. Go to Luke 17, Luke chapter 17, and see there the words of Jesus as the question is raised, will you... Give us the kingdom. Is this the time? And he speaks about it in very basic terms that the kingdom of God is among us and in a sense is within us as well. This is Luke 17, verse 20. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Now, I want to go a little deeper because there's a, something I want to draw our attention to later on when we talk about the Olivet Discourse. So continuing in verse 22, then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. For they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. 
For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in His day. But first, He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So this interesting connection here between the kingdom of God, the return of Jesus, the days of Noah, the days of Lot. And as it was in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, so it will be in the days of when the Lord returns. And by the way, this connection is also made in the Olivet Discourse, and I'll mention that in a moment. But keep in mind, we see two outcomes here. For those who entered in the ark, for those who left Sodom, there was salvation, there was redemption, there was protection. But for those who were outside the ark, for those who remained in the city of sin, there was judgment. Likewise, it will be in the return of our Lord and Savior. Redemption for those who know Him, but judgment eternal for those who do not. Now, what's also fascinating, one last thought to keep in mind, is that the kingdom of God is what is to be proclaimed. It is the good news. It is the gospel, the good news about God from beginning to end. Jesus said early on in the gospel that He was sent by the Father in part to preach the kingdom of God. This is interesting. And they said, please stay here in this city. He said, no, I've got to go to other cities because it is the Father's will that I would go and preach the kingdom of God in other cities. And this is a work that's to continue. A work that Jesus not only fulfilled while He was here on earth, but it's a, a work that He gave to His disciples, the apostles, that they too should go and preach the kingdom of God. Go to Acts, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Jesus is about to ascend. And Luke, who writes Luke and the book of Acts, is writing to Theophilus and giving him an account of all that Jesus both did and that he taught. And so I'm in verse 2 now in Acts chapter 1. Luke says, Until the day in which he was taken up, after through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he presented himself alive after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things, listen to this, pertaining to the kingdom of God. In other words, this is the message that they're going to take out, and they need to be further informed about the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but it was essential that they be given a gift by God in order to fulfill this ministry, to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, You have heard from Me. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they still didn't fully understand it. They asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But for this ministry that you have the proclamation of the kingdom, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And this is exactly what they did. They went out and proclaimed the kingdom of God. What's fascinating is that that's where the book of Acts begins with the kingdom of God. Go to Acts 28 now and see that it also ends with the kingdom of God, the proclamation of the kingdom of God there in Acts 28. And now we've moved on to Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And you'll notice there, while he's in Rome, under house arrest, Acts 28, verse 23, And so when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified, listen to this, of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And God was at work. Some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, but sadly some disbelieved. But it doesn't even end there. Go down to verse 30 now, that same chapter, the last two verses. It says, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. Doing what? Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching all things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, 
no one forbidding him. So the book of Acts begins with the kingdom of God, it ends with the kingdom of God, and I would say it is a mission, a proclamation that is not yet completed. For we are to carry it on. There's a sense in which it's reached all, that is to say all the Gentiles have been reached in a general sense, but we are to proclaim it to all tribes and all tongues until the message of the kingdom of God is declared to all. And this requires using not only our words, but remember that the kingdom of God is supposed to be manifest in our very lives, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so we preach the kingdom of God, we proclaim it, we live it out, knowing that as we see the signs of the times, the return of Jesus, then the kingdom of God, the king in its fullest expression, our ultimate reality is near. For that, let's go back to Luke 21 and be reminded of that once again. That when we see the signs of the times, we are to know that the kingdom of God is at hand, it is near, the king will return. This is Luke 21, verse 31 again. So you also... When you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now, just a quick side note for those of you who like to know details. When he says the generation here, there's three different ways you could understand the word generation. Was Jesus saying that the generation that was present when he was speaking would not pass away until he returned. Well, if that's how you understand it, then in this case, he's speaking about that coming in judgment upon Jerusalem. But the word generation might also refer to the generation of people from the time Christ ascended until he'll come again. If that's the case, then we are part of that generation. And that generation will not come to an end until Christ returns. It is the final generation here on earth, the times of the Gentiles. Jesus also might have been saying, that that final generation, when they see the signs of the time, they will not pass until Christ returns. However you take it, I don't know, but I do know this. His words will not pass away. Heaven and earth will, but what Jesus said will occur. He will return. And therefore, we are to be a watchful people, waiting and looking for His return. With our heads lifted up, for our redemption is near. And therefore, first of all, take heed to ourselves. We do not want... We do not want the here and now to consume us. I'm in Luke 21, verse 34. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down. And notice there's three thoughts here with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And that day come on you unexpectedly. Those three thoughts there, if I understand it correctly, I believe that Jesus is saying three thoughts. Number one, don't ignore reality. Don't seek to escape reality, and don't be overcome with reality. Don't ignore reality. Don't just bounce around from party to party, ignoring what's going on. Don't seek to escape reality, either being drunk or intoxicated with something else, that it should control you. And don't be overcome with reality. Don't be weighed down by the cares of this life. You know, those three thoughts, ignoring reality, trying to escape reality, being overcome with it. I think that's where the majority of most people live. They're trying to do at least one of those things, if not all three. And I think sadly, oftentimes we as Christians also are caught by those three things, trying to ignore it, escape it, or being overcome with all that's taking place. I mentioned connection to Matthew's Gospel, where he records the Olivet Discourse. He also said in that case, as in the days of Noah, so will be in the days when the Lord returned. People will be eating and drinking, they'll be doing life. But in the days of Noah, judgment was about to fall, a worldwide flood. And yet people carried on like everything was normal. They were being warned, but they did not listen. Judgment was at the door. It came in full force. Likewise, it'll be when the Lord returns. It'll be like a snare, verse 35 says, which is a trap which holds people down. And again, for the lost, there is judgment. For the redeemed, it is final salvation in His presence. And so in the meantime... As I mentioned different times as we've studied this, we are to be watchful. Look at verse 36. Watch therefore, and I like this next edition, how appropriate. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand, to stand before the Son of Man. How sweet. I've got to think when we see Him, we're going to fall on our faces and our Master will bid us to stand in His presence. 
So we are to be watchful. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. Watch and pray, for there's no other way to be prepared for the return of Jesus but to watch and pray. Now, I began to talk about this last week, the idea of being watchful. Let me just do a quick review of a couple of them and look at a couple others today. First of all, we noted in Colossians chapter 3 that we're supposed to set our heart and mind on the things above. If we have been risen with Christ and as believers we have spiritually risen with Him, we've also therefore are seated with Him in glory, in a sense, feasting upon the goodness of God. And therefore, we need to stop letting the things of this world, the temporal things, the things that we see, control our thoughts and our minds and our dispositions and our pursuits. I want to just remind us of what I said last week. I think it's good for us to note. Don't let the news of this day, all that's taking place around the world, rob you of your joy in the Lord. It's not that hard to turn off the TV. We got remote controls. Back in the day, you had to get up, and if you were a bad child, you had to find a little controller too because you tossed it someplace. Nowadays, just hit the remote and off it goes. Could I add something else to that? Maybe you need to turn off social media. Maybe, maybe it's not just the news, but it's all the social media. And by the way, parents, either those with young children or teens or if you're raising children, social media can be so, so harmful. I would encourage you, make sure you know what's going on. Put some filters on. Shut the thing down. They are, they are exposed to things that they don't need to know about. They are constantly challenged about who they are and their worth and value. And sometimes they are provoked to do things that are harmful to themselves. But it's not just children. It's us as adults as well. As adults, how often are you challenged that what you have or what you do is not good enough? Clearly, your wardrobe, it stinks. Throw it all out and start again. Obviously, your fifth remodel of your bathroom or kitchen isn't sufficient. You better get to that again. And the car you're driving is a piece of junk, so trade it in. Don't be robbed of the joy of His salvation. Christ is not only enough. He is our all in all. And I guess while I'm on the topic, I'm going to go a little bit further, and no doubt I'll get in trouble. I know we live in a world in which we all think we're influencers. I'm not sure if that's the case. Could I encourage you not to hold your debates online where everybody else is watching? If there's someone who needs a gentle correction, give them a call or better meet with them face to face. Don't take it up online as if you are the master of that domain. Shut it down. But let's make sure because we are to be a people who encourage one another, not who create problems. And this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That passage reminds us that Christ will return and it will be glorious. The passage says the heavens will open up and Christ will descend to shout a voice of an archangel, a trumpet blast to God. And imagine the dead in Christ rising and those who are alive on the earth rising and transformed. And together, and it's going to be great, together in the clouds, not only with one another, but with the Lord. And we're told that we are to encourage one another with these things. This is especially true for those who've lost loved ones in the Lord. Now, I would encourage you not to lead with that right away and say, oh, it's okay, Christ is going to return to make all things right. Sometimes it's best just to sit and be quiet with those who are suffering, just to be there. When the time comes, when the Spirit prompts, then remind, yes, the Lord will return. We are encouraged by these things, aren't we? Also from Hebrews, we were reminded that we are to gather. We are to gather as a people of God to stir up one another to love and to good works. The writer of Hebrews says to draw near, to hold fast, and to press on. But we are to do this together. We don't do this on our own. We do this as a body. I think one of the great challenges for the church post-COVID will be the gathering of the saints. You know, the pastors that I speak to, there's so many of them tell me 30% are gone, 50% are gone, and looking like they probably won't return to faithful gatherings. We have to. It's essential. God has called us to do it. We need to praise God. Can I get an amen on that? But we also need to help one another to draw near, hold fast, and to press on. And again, in a world that focuses so much on self-care and self-love, that this is the norm. We need to be reminded that first and foremost, we must love Christ. And then love His body, one another, and serve one another. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 2, a couple more passages in the text to see. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, John the beloved disciple writes, he tells the early believers that they are to purify themselves. And this is important because it not only reminds us of our conformity to the image of Christ, but in so doing, John says, that you'll have greater confidence. When you purify yourself of sin and all that remains of sin, your confidence will grow in the Lord. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. 
John writes, Now little children abide in Him, that when He appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Doesn't that sound good? To no longer have any shame in His presence. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. In other words, we now have eternal life. We're now part of the kingdom. And yet it's real, not fully realized. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is face to face. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. It is with this hope, by the way, which is confidence. Our hope is not whimsical. It's not wishy-washy. It's secure because our confidence in Christ is there. And therefore, we are to purify ourselves of all that remains of sin and sinful desires. You know, it's not just enough for us to be able to say, well, I didn't do that ugly thing or say that ugly thing. We need to mortify the flesh and the desires of the flesh as they start to rear themselves within. We ought not to ignore. We cannot seek to escape. We shouldn't be overcome by this world. Be reminded that we are overcomers. And therefore, daily we're conformed more and more to His glorious image as He heaps grace upon grace upon grace. Let me say this as well. Please realize, we were talking about this this last week in one of our lead studies, it is a battle. It is a spiritual battle. And the spiritual battle is not the oddity. It's not as if we're wandering around and every now and then we're attacked with a spiritual attack. It is an ongoing thing that takes place. We should think it's odd when we're not under a spiritual attack. This is the norm. And don't think it's strange as you seek Him, as you serve Him, as you strive with others to honor Him, that you'll be attacked by the evil one and his minions. It will happen. And I often remind people, as you're about to serve in a particular way, maybe in a way that you don't typically serve, you better be prepared for the spiritual attack in an intense way. And then afterwards as well, after you think, wow, praise the Lord, look at what's taking place, and suddenly you start to take credit, and then you're attacked heavily. He is the deceiver. He is the divider. I want to add something else. Keep in mind, it's not just the evil one, isn't it? We still, while we're here on this earth, that old dead man still hangs on and wants to drag us down. And just as soon as you think you're doing all right, it's like he trips you up, it's like he whispers in your ear, and off you go in some selfish endeavor. When it rears its ugly head, let's examine ourselves and work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And let's give him thanks that he is the one who not only wills, but accomplishes and works his will in us. The last one I want you to see in Scriptures right now is in Jude. In Jude, I would say Jude 1, but there's only verses in Jude. So make your way towards the final book of the Bible, Revelation, and you'll find that little book, Jude, just 25 verses. And in this particular passage, I want you to be reminded that we are called to persevere. This is what it means to be watchful, to take heed to ourselves. We are to persevere. But in a really odd and unique way, Jude also says that in that perseverance, that we're to be compassionate. I think this is interesting, this combination, because when we're persevering, it's like we're doing everything we can do to hold on, to hang on. He says, no, reach out. Persevere, but reach out in compassion. So notice what he writes there, Jude, verse 20 and following. But you, beloved, building, uh, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. And again, the connection, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making distinction, but on others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So you see once again in this perseverance, and this being watchful, we're to pray. But notice he says, take some responsibility. Strengthen yourself. Strengthen yourself and show mercy. In some cases, pull people even out of the fire and perhaps even the trial of their own making. But the thought is in all things to be compassionate. You see, whether a person falls into a mess, they just stumble into it, or if they intentionally step in it, 
then we need to be those who humbly say, if it weren't for the grace of God, I'd step in it too. And then, with the mercy of Christ, we show compassion. Now what's fascinating is here we're told that we're supposed to keep ourselves, we are supposed to persevere, we're supposed to work at this, and yet most of you know how Jude ends with the reminder that ultimately we don't keep ourselves, it's the Lord who keeps us. What a beautiful reminder. Do what you're supposed to do and then give God all the praise and glory. So look at verse 21 again. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Now verse 24, now to him who is able to do what? To keep you. The one who keeps you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Nothing less than the grace of God is the foundation. We know this even last week as we looked at that passage in Acts. We were told to repent of sin so that our sins might be blotted out, that we might be right with God, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord. That's where we want to be, isn't it? In a world filled with all kinds of problems, where we can get so down and so discouraged, times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. And so I would say again, watch and pray. Watch and pray, watch and pray, for there's no other way to be prepared for the return of Jesus but to watch and pray. And so with that, maybe I need to make a comment about prayer as we close out today. I think prayer is a leading indicator of what we truly value. I think prayer, our commitment, our diligence in prayer shows what we truly value. And I don't know about you, I, I find it, I find it easy throughout the day to just waft up those prayers. When someone comes to mind or I'm on the phone with someone or I hear about a need, I just pray right then and there. But you know what still eludes me to this day is the discipline of prayer. That quiet time every day set aside to just be with the Lord. I've been thinking I need to clear out a closet in the house and just make that the place where there's no distractions. There's nothing else just getting alone with Him. I would say that a people of prayer are a people who are prepared for His presence. And I would say that if we are not a people of prayer, we will find out that we will not do well in the day of adversity, the day of trial, and the day of tribulation. Just a quick reminder, it is around the corner if you're not experiencing it already now. Jesus said, in this world you will have trials and tribulations. But be of good cheer, He said, I've overcome the world. But if you know it's coming, then you ought to prepare. And how should you prepare? By being in prayer spending time with the Lord. I would hope that our desire, my prayer, my desire for us as a people, including myself, but all of us, that we would be like the saints throughout history, a people prepared for His presence, who wanted to be near Him, to behold His glory, and to hear Him. Go back to Luke 21. I want to close out with two verses there, two verses which almost seem like, okay, why are they there? We're transitioning between the end of chapter 21 and the beginning of 22. But there's a little nugget there that is sweet for us to notice in Luke 21. It says, in the daytime he was teaching in the temple. And by the way, remember, this is the last week. We're probably on Tuesday when he is going to be crucified on Friday. And so this is, this is near the end when he would suffer for you and for me. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. That's a good place for us to live, isn't it? Early in the morning, to seek the Lord, to hear him, and to walk with him. Heavenly Father, we again want to give you thanks. We want to give you thanks for you are a good and gracious King. Oh, how sweet it's going to be one day to be in your presence and to be allowed to stand, to see you face to face. To be done with the, the battle of selfishness here, the taunts of the evil one and his minions the problems that we encounter. May all these things, Lord, fade in the light of Your glory and grace. And may we be reminded again that we need You. 
Help us to understand there is no greater thing than knowing you. And cause us to be a people prepared for your return. Help us to lift up our heads that our countenance might be high as we see the things transpire, knowing that soon the day is approaching that your son Jesus will return and make all things right. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.